my contribution to this honor school is to present how Croatia and RPP are connected. And my thesis is that Croatia uh, has no other option but to accept and advocate for RPP. Of course, uh, before we start with, with the main topics, I will have to make two notes. And then I will start with where are we right now here in Croatia and Dubrovnik. We are in beautiful city Dubrovnik. And uh, students and professors who physically participate at this school has had yesterday the opportunity to go to the top of the hill called Search and to see the beauty of this city. However, this was not always like this. Uh, if you go to 19, 1991, in October, 1st of October, it started on 1st of October and it lasted for one year, the Bromic was in war and there was a shelling of the Brom. And this situation from 1991 is very much similar to other situations that happen to war. This is also my thesis. This is the same situation in some context. I mean, like what we see in these pictures, and this is destruction. This is the same like what happens, what happened in, in Syria, what happened, what is happening in some way in Myanmar. And what is interesting also from your discussion, your points and the questions, which were very much interesting, interesting is that people, citizens of the Dubrovnik in 1991 had the same hope like those people in Myanmar. And the hope was that international community will intervene and stop this. However, this did not happen and it didn't happen in Syria and we can see that it does not happen again in Myanmar. So, the history repeats. Besides Dubrovnik city, which is on the south of, uh, south of Croatia, I would like to also introduce to you another city, which is on the, let's say, east, northeast of Croatia, which is called Vukovar. So, Vukovar is today also a beautiful city, but it was not so beautiful in 1991. So you, could, you can see on these pictures, on the first picture, the picture of destroyed Vukovar after... The, the similarity between Dubrovnik and Vukovar, these two Croatian cities, that they are both under the siege of Yugoslav people's, so-called Yugoslav people's army, and Serbian and Montenegrin volunteers or paramilitary groups. In all these atrocity situations, we always have these par paramilitary groups. This is one of the atrocity risks, as you know. So we have Vukovar after uh, the difference between Dubrovnik and Vukovar was that Dubrovnik succeeded to defend itself, and Vukovar unfortunately was not of that fate. It failed, it was occupied, and what happened after occupation, a few days after occupation, is something that is known today as Ovchara. And Ovchara is a massive, massive grave. So it is the place of executions. Again, here in the Bronic, we didn't have this scenario. Most, I don't know what would happen if, if the Bronic also failed. Vukovar failed and Ocha happened. So after occupation of Vukovar, the, pre, the people from the hospital, from the hospital, okay, okay there are some. Uh, people who were soldiers, but also civilians, civilians there were taken to one place. They were tortured, beaten, and after that, killed. To 250 to 264 people were killed, Croats and non Serbs. One of the victims there was a French. Uh, and I think that there was also one person who was from Germany. So 
this is what happens. What happened? This was the at that time the worst massacre after the Second World War, and this happened in Europe. Not we, we used to talk about how to be now in Asia or in Africa, but this was the 1990s in Europe. Uh, the human rights are protected. That we have, we, we think that we have a safe situation. Okay, uh, what next for the first note? We are talking about Croatia, these two cities, and they are placed uh, in Europe, as you know, and they are placed in what is called Southeast Europe. And sometimes, sometimes this, this part of the world is also called Western Balkan, but I will explain that this is a more political term. It can be also used as a geographical term, but there is a reason why uh, it is used as a political term. Uh, Balkan is a mountain, and you can see that on the first picture, and that it goes through different countries, including Croatia, for example, Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, and so on. So, uh, from Australia, for those who are looking at this from Australia and Asia, we are in Europe, look at the map on Southeast, and you will find there some states, like Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, which before was consisted also of two autonom autonomous provinces, Vojvodina and Kosovo. I think that you know now situation in Kosovo. Kosovo is recognized as the state by some states, and some states are not recognized Kosovo as the state. We have Montenegro, we have Macedonia, and we have also Albania here. It, it is not, uh, it, it, it is also important to include here Albania and this, let's say, this part of the world can also be called Western Balkan, e or in geographical term, if you, if some people don't like this term, could be called Southeast Europe. So we, now we know where we are. What we also have to, to know before the start of the presentation, that 1990s were very interesting years. Of course, you know that at the, at the 1990s uh, or uh, 1989, the communist regimes uh, failed and new political situations in the world appears. The world order changed, changed in one, one way. So, one of the consequences was also the solutions of multinational, multinational states in the 1990s. For example, Soviet, uh, United Soviet Republics, uh, they there was dissolution on the second picture. You could see this dissolution, and some states appeared, new states, for example, Lithuania, Estonia, and Europe. This, these were the new states in Europe. Also, you have, for example, the solution in Czechoslovakia in 1993, and today we have two states, Czech and Slovakia, and the state which was called uh, SFR yeah. Which is in between Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia, also was in the process of dissolution. What is important to see that the, the first uh, the first national solution of Soviet republics and Czechoslovakia was peaceful dissolution in basics. So there was no war between Czech, 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 uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia Republic to, to have this dissolution. And we accept these two states as normal members of the EU, no one questions that. The dissolution of Yugoslavia was bloody dissolution. Today, the situation is that two of these states, Slovenia and Croatia, are the member of the EU. They have uh, go through the, the process of transition. They uh, adopt EU, EU rules and uh, change their institutions. And after the, the negotiations that became the member of uh, members of the European Union as regional organization occurred here that in Africa we have regional organization like Western, like uh, African Union or in Asia, Asia. So in Europe we have the European Union and other organizations. Uh, other republics or states of uh, Western Balkan are in process of accession. So we have Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
uh, Serbia, uh, Kosovo, and uh, North Macedonia, which was before called uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, there was a problem with the name, and Alban Albania. So when we talk, uh, talk about Western Balkans, here we are, we are using political term for those states which are numbered here and mentioned here, and they are in process of accession to EU. Uh, again, to atrocities, as you could see, we have the Rome in 1991. There are two, at least two persons, there are two persons uh, sentenced uh, in front of the, on, by ICTY for the crimes that they have committed uh, in Dubrovnik. We had Vukovar 1991 also sentenced uh, atrocities crime. We also have something happening in Vojvodina, autonomous pro province in Serbia, and the case I provided to you is from this region, and these things like atrocities in, in, the, in the terms of crimes against humanity appeared in 1991. We had Srebrenica, you know, for Srebrenica in 1995, we had Kosovo 1999, all atrocities. And then what happened, we had 1999, finally, if you could see the list from 1991 to 1999, nine, so eight, uh, nine years, we had NATO bombing of Serbia and Montenegro. Now, whatever we think about uh, this intervention, and there are huge discussion about was that legal or illegal intervention uh, act of NATO and so on. It is interesting to see how the uh, Serbian see this intervention. If you go, if you read the newspapers or some uh, publicly available texts, you will see, for example, from the mouth, mouth of the pre current uh, president of Serbia, that it was a NATO aggression, NATO aggression, that citizens of Serbia will never forget this crime. It sounds like atrocity crime, which is committed against us, against Serbia, as a coalition of the 19 most powerful states. This is the, the discur discourse which is present also uh, today in, in this region. Also, you could see that the, the current president was at that time the Minister of Information. And according to these texts, he also uh, had influenced how the texts uh, would be written at that time. And the texts in the Egyptian journalists and newspapers of Serbia at that time qualified these acts as Nazis and fascist, fascist acts. Uh, for example, we have one journal which says, which says said it was the German Nazi fascism. Uh, the discourse of, of UN on, on that time was different. So we all, all remember Kofi Annan, Secretary General, who said in 2000, if humanitarian intervention is an acceptable assault on severity, how should we respond? How should we respond to Rwanda, to Srebrenica, because they are to all child? To gross and systematic violation of human rights that offend every percept of our human common humanity. And this was the start part of our. So if we are looking for the origin of our to be I don't know if I'm Okay, so this is about this person. This is the first note, and I'm not sure that I, I will manage to, to come to the main point. Uh, another note 
discourse on atrocity, uh, political discourse, which could be an atrocity risk. We know that, that the, the words that we use can influence our acts, and it depends on what is said. So I will, I will give you an example of, of how this could be a problem. Uh, you know that uh, in, uh, in our everyday communication, we use rhetoric skills and rhetoric uh, techniques, and that we can persuade someone, even if you are wrong, that we can persuade someone that you are right. So there is a technique also of thesis replacement, which is very popular in this region. I will give you an example. For example, thesis one, I claim that state uh, Why is responsible for atrocities? Because if their organs committed atrocity crimes against the population of state X. So state X is responsible for the atrocity crimes by state uh, Y against population of state X. This is the thesis two. You could, you could see the replacements of the thesis. Yeah? So for the, for the speaker to, to, to make this, the, the change of thesis, he has to justify the thesis, the second thesis. How he can do that? For example, he could do that in the following way. Fascist states committed atrocities during World War II. State X was a fascist state. We can add, and you, you could see this kind of rhetoric already in the, in the what I showed before. Now we could add more state. State X, which was part of the confederation together with the state Y, was established in 1991 by the same fascists. Correctly, and it was recognized by the internet by international community due to international fascist crime project. And now you came to the third false conclusion. First false false conclusion is state X, X is artificial state that should not exist. This is the first false uh, statement or conclusion from these, these these sentences. And the second false conclusion is. Since state X is guilty for its existence, it is responsible for the atrocities committed by the state Y against the population of state X. This model can be found in literature. For example, in these books of uh, this person, and his, called, his name is uh, Sheshen, and he's important for our case. I hope that you read a little bit about that. So he, he wrote lots of books. One of the books is The Roman Catholic Criminal Project of the Artificial Croatian Nation, or American Anti Serbian Instrument of Alia Zbegovic. Alia Zbegovic was the president of Bosnia Herzegovina, and so on, the, the ideology of Serbian nationalism, and so on and so on. So it is important to, to recognize this kind of discourse and to, to listen what they are talking to us and to make conclusions by ourselves. Uh, these discourse can influence, of course, action. Because if I'm saying that in public and people are listening to me, they could go and make some trouble. They could go to, to houses of other people and kill them. The same person basically was motivated by, by his own words. You can see that how words becomes action. Uh, what he did during the 2018, so three years ago, that person was his, he was the member of the parliament, civil parliament. He traveled on the Croatian flag during the, the official visit of Croatia to Serbia. Imagine that someone burned the, the, the flag of Germany or Denmark. So, what is the reaction of, what is the reaction of European Union on that? Uh, and what is more, it's also important that ICTY, of course, sentenced Sheshe in that time uh, for, to 10 years of prison exactly for nationalist speeches. And also, there is a consequence of it that this that he, according to Serbian law, could not be in the parliament because he was sentenced. And if you are sentenced, you cannot be in the parliament. And now we can come to creation or to be and why R2P is important for Croatia. But before that, uh, clarifications, because your questions indicate that clarifications are important. What is R2P? R2P, we are talking about r What does R2P refer to? I think it's good to start 
of this is my proposal to to say that it can refer to conception we, we have different conceptions maybe this conception of voice of Cheshire is also worldwide to look at it the one to be conception theoretical conception this is one thing it can be referred to doctrine doctrine can be political or legal and it can refer to norm what I understand by norm is that norm contains or, or it is connected with obligation. And I'm talking about the norm. I, if there is a norm, someone has an obligation okay, to, con to conduct in a certain way. And what is important, uh, that there is a reaction if the norm is breached. So if we said we will meet at 10, if someone is not in, uh, at 10 here, we will react to, to that. And that, then we have a norm. So we have political norm and legal norm. And usually R2P is seen only as political norm. My, my opinion, which could be wrong, is that it is a legal norm. And what, mean, what does it mean that it is a legal norm? It means not only obligation, but also that uh, reaction should be legal sanction. That is what differs political from legal, legal norms. And we can say if it is the norm, we could say that it is one norm or maybe two, and these two are principles, and there are also stories about principles. Uh, the first principle is the state is responsible to protect its own population. This is the first principle. And as I said, someone could see that as the legal principle. And the second principle is that there is responsibility of international community, which is per, uh, the sub principle of the second. International community should assist states so that they can protect if they are not capable to protect their population. And second, if you have manifestly failing state, that means that they cannot, they, they will not protect their population, you and no assistance is, can change in that situation. The national community is obliged to react. So back to Croatia. Uh, the, the whole story about creation of the peak could be seen through in two contexts. I propose that to, to see Croatian policy towards R2P and the, what is R2P in Croatia through the lenses of Croatia and European Union, because now we have a member of European Union. And the second lenses, uh, lenses are the Croatia on, and the Western Balkan, because we are on the Western Balkan, Croatia graphically. So, in the first context, uh, I think that Christina yesterday talked about EU policy and mentioned important, important, important uh, things. And we have we discussed also these things here. You, you, you mentioned that. What is EU perspective? Because we should share EU perspective on our On one way, I claim, this is my friend, this strongly supportive perspective. EU, European Union member states are strongly for our On the other side, you have some problems with implementation of part of the effective perspective concerning the implementation of a part of it. And these two things uh, reflect on Croatia. So what about Croatia? Croatia supports our in 2000, it is usually what, what uh, academic, academic scholars do. They go to in, in, in legal materials, for example, sessions of UN assembly, and they are looking for uh, what, how the states uh, react, how they behave at the time, at the, this time. So Croatia is absolutely for for World uh, Summit uh, out, outcome document. After that, you can find it on the web page. They said they this is our position in UN. You will not find Croatia not supporting the, any R2P act, any. Uh, and, okay, we have also that. We have also important to 2021. Uh, Point resolution, uh, which was also initiated by uh, our representative in UN, and it is important resolution on on on, on R2P. We also, as as a country, to participate in development assistance, support of human rights participation, peacekeeping missions, send our troops to Afghanistan, for example, to to react. Uh, on the other side, you have a cooperation problem. I will not focus on that because uh, Martin already mentioned that. For example, in Croatia, this is a problem of EU. You cannot see how they, where are the documents about that? Can you see R2P in strategic documents of Croatia? 
Uh, Christina mentioned the first strategic document the European Union for, it appeared in 2013, if I'm not wrong. Problem. Uh, second problem is implementation problem. And there is implementation problem in all three pillars. And the first pillar, I will connect that with normative power because Croatia is part of the European Union. It, European Union tries to influence other parts of the world to, to make, to improve some things. How could you improve things if, the, if your own country has problems with human rights? If you, your own country has problems with refugees? So in pillar one, Croatia could do more. And there are some problems which are detected, for example, by the final of the support to, to, to all of us can read. Second problem is, for example, the refugee crisis also mentioned by Christina yesterday. Uh, is it RTP issue? Yes, it is, because it, it is about assistance. Uh, this Afghanistan situation, it's not only about, it is the most what we should, should react, in my opinion. But it, also, it is also about that refugees will come to Croatia. And we remember, and European Union, Europe, and we remember 2015. And I hope that you remember how, this, how, how the problem was resolved at that time. Uh, the, the policy is absolutely uh, not adequate. And it does not offer the response to, to the situation, my opinion. Pillar three, you have in European Union members ambiguous approach to military intervention. There are some writings about that, I don't know, maybe you know more about that. What is the position of Germany towards the military intervention? I'm talking about intervention cases if you have atrocities in front of you, what it happens. Should you support or not? And uh, my point here is also that, that in Pillar 3, we have the problem with lack of intervention to the institution of international quasi legal procedures. This is what you mentioned before about courts. Because my approach is a little bit like a uh, crime-based approach to RTP. I think these are crimes, there is the side delicts, and for that you should have sanctions. Is yes, it is. So if in the international community is different kind of community, okay, but you have some quasi-legal procedures. This situation how to initiate legal procedures. And what happens then? Yeah, there are some problems, but still, is that the way how we can resolve some things? Maybe, maybe not. Now, back to Western Balkan. Okay, I mentioned this difference. So, regarding Croatia and Western Balkan, on one side, we share the history of Western Balkan. Of course, as was mentioned yesterday, the situation in Myanmar is complex. Of course, it's complex. And I cannot understand. And the situation on Western Balkan is complex. And who can understand from outside? What happens? What happened here? What are the? What is the history? What is the social norms, morality? What is the culture of this part of the world, or in Africa, or in other parts of the world? So we share this history. We share the norms, political morality of this part of the world, and the influence is that, in my opinion, Croatia has specific responsibility for our Western Balkan states. Regarding morality, we have in Croatia conflict between EU political morality and Western Balkan political morality. And this reflects on important topics, for example, minorities. EU, EU, EU political morality calls that Croatia has wonderful things regarding minorities. It has uh, representation of minorities in the parliament. The model is one that no other country except Slovenia partially has in, in Europe or even in the world. It's one of the main states that uh, adopted this kind of model. Wonderful. Why is, why is uh, Prime Minister in Croatia is from the minority group? Uh, majority depends on minorities at the moment. So you could read reports, things are progressively uh, improving. Uh, but still, Western Balkan political morality. We have problems with hate crimes, we have the problems with hate speech, we have the problem with Attitudes towards the refugees, these are all important. International criminal law, wonderful story. Croatia was one of the states that initiate, was signed, okay, maybe some of us would say push, but we are the initiators of ICT1, International Criminal Tribunal. We are very much for international justice, and we would like to see 
as British rights to see international justice and courts functioning in a way so that uh, trustees are punished. On the other side, you can have problems with courts in creation. You have a problem with uh, war crime trials, they last too long, so local trials. You have a problem with judiciary because, because there is a problem with the understanding of the rule of law. This is Western Balkan understanding concept of the rule of law. And you can see that in, in, in Croatia on different levels. Refugees. You, this is the problem of EU, also EU problem. EU, in the first, when the, the first refugee crisis appears, the policy of EU was, as you know, they can come. Okay? And one million of refugees entered the EU. And because of that, there were, there were no conflicts between states and Western Balkan because it was a very dramatic period for this part of the world. After that, policy change. EU does not want anymore to pay refugees on its rights. Let's have it in front of the EU in Turkey and we will pay them for that. So, policy change. And you could see how the EU policy changed, that Croatian policy changed. I was there when the refugees were in Slovenia. People in Slovenia say, yes, welcome. Uh, police officers behave properly to, to, to those migrants, not on refugees, but migrants. Now we have reports in Croatia on, on, on misbehaving of, of police officers. Okay? There are some uh, indications that, or, or, or reports, I'm not telling you that it is true, true or not, but the reports are there that uh, we have some kind of push outs, but this is not only for Croatia. This is something that, that, that you at least tolerate. In other circumstances, it will not tolerate. It happens because the policy of EU change. This is also where uh, this kind of two moralities question. And then we have as a country responsibility towards these states. But let me say a little bit more on the situation of uh, shortly of Western Balkans towards RTP. What about Montenegro and RTP? What about Bosnia and Herzegovina and RTP? Western Balkan states or Serbia and RTP? It's interesting to see because on one side, yes, there is a acceptance in 2005. Later on, exactly on this, this uh, uh, 2021, the last uh, resolution, uh, resolution of the uh, UN General Assembly, you have different reactions. Serbian voice and Turkish government did not vote for. You have some uh, 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 statements which shows, okay, I could be, but you are skeptical about that because remember what happened in 1991. 1999. Then you can the you could see the reports of human rights situations there, analysis, and then what is the role of Croatia and the European Union states there. Uh, Croatia provides assistance to Montenegro, Serbia, other states in consultancy, how to go through accession process, how to reform their institutions. But I think that what is missing is adequate reaction of Croatia and also of European Union to uh, situations in Western Balkans. And this is where I come to the concrete case. And I thought that we could talk about basically the case. This is one of the cases I picked up because I like thesis, because it's about people and humans. We are talking not about concepts. We are talking about perceptions, but at the end is we are talking about men and women who have rights. So my top language and uh, Ivan Mianovic. Have their rights once in 1991. Situation in, in, we are in uh, Vojvodina, this is autonom autonomous province of uh, Serbia. You have Serbian Radical Party, Voice of Shesher, and speeches about uh, great Christ and Serbs in, in their problematic way. So there were advocates uh, of the, uh, the campaign of intimidation and pressure on the drug population world. And it lasted for some years. So you have the framework, because the first crimes that don't, does not appear from nowhere. It's not that someone will kill someone on sleep. It's prepared in a way. So the persecution of Croatian families appears and the result was that 18,000 of Croats left Vojvodina. It's like decreased for 20, uh, 24%. 
This is the context. Uh, the facts on the case are that family of Yana, which lived in the small village Moronich, it's a municipality sheet, one day it was October 23rd, Two great cars bearing, you know, this is creation of people's army, basically it's a new army at the time. They arrive to their house and they say that well, they want Marta Bianch to go with that for hearing. Yeah? And he didn't, he, they said they had a warrant, but they didn't show the warrant. He refused, he didn't propose, but he said, I wouldn't like to go. Uh, his wife said, I will go with you, but then the brother of Marta arrived and uh, he said, I will go, Ivica, and I will go with you. And two of them sit in the car and go in direction, we don't know which part. Uh, this was the last time that they were seen. We know that there, there is also a concept of enforced disappearance, and it, it can be interpreted as torture. Uh, the same evening, uh, wife and son. The young boy went to the sheep police station and asked, what is going on? Where is my father? Where is my, where is my uh, husband? The police, chief police officer said, we didn't issue the order at the time. Tomorrow I will explain more when I find out. Uh, they came again in the morning, the members of the family and the, the response of the police chief officer there was they were taken by other by the other side and she said which side and she said Ustash ashes to them from the other side. Again okay. uh, legally there was no information to the family about what happened. Can you imagine that someone comes here and took one of you and you disappear? And no, no, no information about what happened. So no one asked anymore. Official institutions in Croatia, we don't know. Not, not even that. No information, provision of what happened. This was at least a trial, but nothing else. So, uh, judiciary in the 1990s, two men disappeared in the context. Remember the context. Uh, not, not effective investigation. I don't know if lawyers know the concept of effective and investigation, you have to do whatever you can to find this person. It's not that you have to find the criminal, but you have to do whatever you can to find the criminal. In 2004, family uh, go to the district public prosecutor's office and feel the criminal complaint, where is my husband? Where is my father? And they refused that, saying that it's, there is institute of being stated of limitation. It's a murder. It's a, you know, if you, if you can't get to it, you can't do it. But even from here, we have the problem because of their law, it is not only murder, but it is a serious murder because two persons were killed. But let's leave that alone. 2000, now, two years ago, okay? NGO in Serbia, this is the how we get people difference also. They start a new procedure and they said clearly this was uh, a crime against men. The answer of the institution of the state prosecutor was the following no appearance in a lay, no appearance in a lay. So there is no punishment or there is no crime if it was not written in the Serbian law at that time, and it was not, there was no crime of, of uh, crime against humanity in their law. So, Legal security. And we know the member cases, we know the ICTY practices, we know what is international law and this international law of the national law in these cases, and so on. So, this is something for discussion. The question here is what the Gyanovich family can do? This is maybe a little legal question, but even non legals, we're all citizens of the states, we, we could think about it. Or even more important for our discussion, what an adequate reaction of state which is regarding itself as responsible state to such a situation. What's, what state should do in this situation? And if we are going to resolve this case, we could go to different directions that could be proposed. 